Welcome to Her Story, a retelling of the biblical narratives featuring women in scripture with Joanne Guarnieri Hagemeyer, Grace and Peace Joanne. Season two, The Time of the Matriarchs, opens with the iconic tale of Sarah, a pioneer of faith alongside her famous husband, Abraham. Her story has been told and retold, but there are still questions. What did she understand about God's great promises? How did she see herself in the grand vision God had presented to Abraham? And what crises of love and of faith did she face? Let's re-examine the story of Sarah. Each story in this series was originally produced as a YouTube presentation, so links to YouTube, Grace and Peace Joanne blog posts, and the books I've written are all provided below. Sarah's story begins with the genealogy of her father Terah, recorded in Genesis 11. Now these are the descendants of Terah. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran was the father of Lot. Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his birth, in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Evidently, though Abram is listed first, Haran was actually the oldest son, and he must have married young and died young, because after having three children, two daughters named Milcah and Iscah, and a son named Lot, Haran died, and his father Terah ended up raising his grandchildren. In that day, it was not uncommon for families to intermarry, so in due course, Abram's brother Nahor eventually married his niece Milcah, his brother Haran's daughter, and Abram also married within their family, but we don't find out until later in Sarah's story that her father was Abram's father, Terah, as Abram would finally admit to the king Abimelech. She is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. She was born, Sarai, about 4,000 years ago, into a wealthy family living in the city of Ur, in the ancient land of the Chaldeans, south of Babylonia. Today that area covers Iraq and East Syria and Southeast Turkey. One day, for undisclosed reasons, Terah decided to move his extended family to a place called Haran in ancient Mesopotamia, very likely located near the modern village of Haran in Azerbaijan today and the prevailing Sumerian religions were polytheistic, so that means the surrounding people groups worshipped about 2,100 different deities, and many of them were associated with specific cities or states within that region. The Chaldeans, in particular, worshipped the sun and the moon and the planets, and it was commonplace for families to have household shrines for their idols, and Terah was no different. The Bible records that he and his household worshipped idols. The game changer for Sarai came in Genesis 12, when Almighty God spoke to Abram. Shortly thereafter, she found herself packing up and living the life of a Bedouin, headed towards an unnamed land God would eventually show them, which would one day be filled with Abram's descendants. But God's promises were long in coming. Abram and Sarai grew wealthier and wealthier for sure, but they were also growing older and older with no descendants. Abram probably first thought his nephew Lot would be his heir. But early in their travels, Lot decided to break ties with Abram. And then Abram settled his hopes on a trusted servant. But God made it clear the servant was not the plan. All along the way, Abram and Sarai also knew there was another lever they could pull to make things happen. It was in the Sumerian law, written by the ruler of Ur-Namu, the city of Ur, later embedded in the code of Hammurabi. Sumerian law scaled punishments, graded social status, dealt with judgments, contracts, wages, marriage, sex, and property laws. It also provided a clause for barren wives. If a wife could not produce an heir, she could give her husband one of her enslaved girls as a surrogate. The baby the captive girl produced would in every way be considered the wife's child. And so the truth here is that faith in God requires resisting cultural and social pressures. And for many years, Abram and Sarah quietly, confidently believed against all odds that God would bless them as the Lord had promised. And they remained both faithful to their marriage and faithful to God. They did resist those cultural and social pressures, but things changed. 
Sarah E. would have felt the increasing pressure from her culture as she grew older, but for years she'd resisted. So what changed? Now Sarah E., Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar, and Sarah E. said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go in to my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah E. Sarah E. had evidently said to herself, The Lord promised my husband a son, through whom God means to fulfill all God's promises. Yet God never said the son would come through me. God has actually prevented me from having children. Maybe the Lord intends to fulfill this promise some other way. But Sarah E. didn't want God to leave her totally out of the picture. She reasoned that through Hagar she could be built up because Hagar's children would be legally Sarah E.'s children, giving Sarah E. the honor of motherhood in the extended household's eyes and in her community's eyes at large, and in which Abram held a prominent position. So let's slow down a minute and think about what Sarah E. must have believed. She believed God and Abram had a relationship. She believed God had great things in mind for her husband. But she also believed God was preventing her from being part of those great things. She believed she wasn't going to be part of the equation. Have you ever felt that way? Because I know I have. You're the expendable one. Not important to God's plan. Or even the plan God has for your beloved ones. And Abram had actually given her plenty of reason to think this way. Twice he had asked her to risk her life to save his life. The first time happened during a famine, so they went down to Egypt to shelter. And Abram said to his wife, Sarai, I know well that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. And then they will kill me, but they'll let you live. So say you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared on your account. Fear, not faith, was driving Abram when he drew his wife Sarai into deception. He hadn't left her with much choice. If she spoke up now, it would jeopardize their safety. But to go along was to tacitly agree to adultery at best and divorce at worst. Sarai must have trusted in God, though the Bible doesn't describe how she felt. What's implied is that Sarai found herself cornered in a situation in which she tried to honor her husband the best she knew how, believing in faith that God would protect her. And God did. You know, later there came an interesting passage that uh, comes in the books of Moses, Numbers 30. You can look it up if you like, verses 5 and 15, that talk about when a husband or a father overrides the woman's vow, then the Lord will forgive the woman and hold the husband or the father accountable. And that must have happened here. As Abram overrode his wife's vow of faithfulness to him in marriage, God forgave her, but God held Abram accountable. Eventually, even though he was angry, Pharaoh allowed Abram to keep all that Pharaoh had given him so long as they left immediately. And it may have seemed to Abram that he could get away with sin with impunity, and God would just rescue him. But what looked like a reward would later bring grief not only to Abram, but to Sarai and ultimately to the nation of Israel. One of Abram's newly acquired slaves was a beautiful young girl named Hagar, who would feature tragically later in their marriage. All the newly acquired wealth caused strife between Abram's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen as soon as they were back in Canaan. And all this time, impressionable Lot had been observing his uncle Abram, man of God, man of the promise. And this is what Lot learned. Wealth is more important than people. Look out for your own self. It doesn't matter what happens to the other person. Lot would remember that when it was time to choose between the scrubby highlands or the lush lowlands, that the other person doesn't count. Just look out for your own. Lot learned that it's okay to compromise your integrity if it makes you rich. He would remember that when he was living in Sodom. Lot learned that when the chips are down, it's okay to send your women out to the wolves if it will save your own skin, because that's just exactly what he did with his own daughters. Everything Lot learned from Abram in Egypt would bring grief, sorrow, and suffering to Abram 
and his descendants for centuries to come. And it spread out into Lot and Lot's life, and it founded two nations of people who would end up being enemies with Israel. What you and I do really matters. We are always teaching with our life what it means to belong to God. And incredibly, it happened again. This time, soon after God destroyed the cities of the plain, Abram pulled up stakes, and as he led his caravan to each new place, he relapsed into his old ways of fear and self-protection, pretending Sarai was his sister. Predictably, Abimelech, a powerful king of Gerar, took Sarah as his wife. It went very badly though God did restore both Abram's and Abimelech's fortunes in the end. But the truth here is that faith in God requires faithfulness to God and to others. Twice, Abram had let other men take his wife Sarai, and he had even accepted bride prices for her, basically thrown her under the bus, because he believed, and apparently she also believed, that he was important to God's plan while she was expendable. This was an old, repeated sin. By fearing his situation instead of fearing and having faith in God, Abram's thinking about everything else unraveled. He thought the worst of Abimelech. He didn't respect his wife, and he didn't honor his marriage. After what had happened in Egypt, and even worse with Abimelech, Abram should have asked for Sarai's forgiveness. He should have committed to the truth of their relationship no matter what. He should have promised to trust God from here on out. He should have honored the one flesh God had made them to be. But he didn't. The Bible never records Abram doing any of those things. But there is a lesson for you and me. Repentance protects us from something far worse happening down the line. And there were many bad decisions to come. Abram had given Sarai no reason to believe she was important to God's plan. And Sarai loved her husband. Think of the genuine and costly sacrifice it was for her to do what she did. Maybe Sarah was really looking to be built up in Abram's eyes. Abram had only one wife, and he seemed content with her. But to give him the son of his heart's desire, Sarai was willing to sacrifice that relationship, and in all sincerity she was quite prepared to go through with it, cost her what it may. She proposed it. And it took courage, it took resolve, to give up what is a wife's most precious possession, the right to have her husband's sole affection. And Hagar was young. Presumably she was a virgin to ensure that the child was Abram's and no others. Hagar was healthy. Very likely she was beautiful, or at least pretty, so the child would also be beautiful. And it would have been a great place for Abram to say, Stop! No, Sarai, our marriage is sacred. You are part of the plan. I don't know how God's going to do it, but God will do it. Because not only do you mean the world to me, having a child with anyone else would be unthinkable. But Abram didn't say that. And that actually says a lot to me about their relationship. A lot of distance, a lot of unsaid conversations, and a lot of unshared emotions. So how did this perfect plan work out? Terrible. When you and I deal with real life and the daily things of life in our own way, the results are going to bring up all the broken emotions and broken behavior that fallen people naturally fall into. All Sarai's relationships got worse. Hagar's contempt. Sarah lost honor rather than gained honor by the very process that was supposed to build her up. The blame game. Of course, she blamed this all on Abram. And that's what had been broken in the first place. Abram's lack of honor for his own wife and his willingness to get hold of God's promises through this self-doing instead of faith. Irresponsibility and callousness. Instead of bringing repentance and peace, Abram handed the crisis back off to Sarai. And venting rage. A distant husband, a contemptuous slave, a plan that had gone terribly wrong, Sarai was only too willing to vent her anger and disappointment on Hagar. And the whole household was now in an uproar. But each of them could have said, we were only trying to do God's will. Each one was sure the others were all to blame, and none was willing to face the sin in his or her own heart. All this because of trying to help God when it seemed the Lord wasn't doing anything, or that time would run out for God or for them, 
before it could all be accomplished. And we learned something very important. Faith in God requires trusting God. Trusting God's word and God's timing and God's ways, God's character, God's faithfulness and trustworthiness, God's love. Trusting God. Sarah E. and Abram were believers. They knew God's word. They believed it. They were living by God's word in the big outward ways. But their thinking, their mindset was way off. Their theology was way off. They did not leave room for God to work in miraculous ways. For the Lord to display God's glory in the promises God had made, they looked to conventional means to get God's plan underway. And they were in desperate need of being transformed together. And that is exactly what God had in mind when the Lord came to visit them 13 years later. In God's visit, the Lord renamed Sarai and Abram. As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Now one meaning of Sarah's old name, Sarai, is contentious, which may speak volumes about the home life of Abram and Sarai. The Apostle Peter said she became a model for all women to follow when she became Sarah, which means princess. When she became Sarah, she lost her contentious spirit, and she learned to develop a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. And the Lord also employed the very same language in God's promise to Sarah as God had used with Abram. They were one flesh. Nations and kings would come from them both together, husband and wife. This is God's way and had been from the very beginning. Abraham and Sarah were both vitally important and their relationship was vitally important to God and to God's purposes. God also, as much for Abraham's sake as for Sarah, made a special point of honoring Sarah as fully equal in their marriage and in God's purposes. The angels of the Lord and the Lord said to Abraham, Where's your wife Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. When Sarah laughed secretly, God called her out, but not so much as to humiliate her or to chastise her, but rather to let her know and to let Abraham know that God heard Sarah. God heard her inward thoughts. God knew the matters of her heart. Whereas Abraham had always had a secure relationship with God, Sarah had felt left out and unnecessary, even prevented by God from being included in the great covenant and promises given to Abraham. But Sarah's heart mattered to God, for God was going to transform her laugh of disbelieving pain into laughter filled with joy as she held the child of promise Isaac in her arms. Now, Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The Lord values and honors every person who puts their faith in God. Now, much has been made of the Apostle Peter's example of Sarah in the Christian Testament. Here's a rendition of 1 Peter 3, 5-6 by a Greek scholar who has taken into account all the unearthed inscriptions and papyri of the last 50 years. Super important. In this way, too, once upon a time, the holy women who fixed their hopes on God adorned themselves. They supported their own husbands in the way that Sarah paid attention to Abraham, calling him Sir. You are her children if you do the right thing, and you are not afraid of intimidation. The Greek word here for support or submit is hupakuo. It means to attend to, to listen to, to answer, to respond to. In some contexts, it can also mean to heed or conform to and also to obey. The context for Peter's instruction was to women married to unbelieving men and to their response in Christ to their husbands 
to be as witnesses for Christ's love and grace. Sarah became a supreme example of this mission-minded love, faithfulness, and grace. Because even though she was married to a believing man, he had not respected her or honored her for most of their marriage, and he had not included her in the purposes God had for them both. Sarah's grace, after the Lord's revelation of her importance and inclusion of God's plan, became Peter's illustration and portrayal of hope to the unequal marriages he was writing about in his letter. Our culture and law does not look to God, but to earth for answers. Often, living out our faith will look foolish and impractical through the eyes of our culture, but faith in God requires resisting cultural and social pressures. Often, fear is what drives us to be faithless. Fear that is translated into these self-protective ways. Often, faith will require us to live out integrity and fidelity, even though that feels unsafe trusting that God will prevail and be glorified in the end, because faith in God requires faithfulness to God and to others. In fact, faith in God simply requires trusting God. God's word, God's timing, God's ways, God's character, God's attributes, who God is, God's love and faithfulness requires trusting God. And finally, Sarah e and Abram both learned that the Lord values and honors every person who puts their faith in God, and that's how they became Sarah and Abraham. Oh God, thank you for Sarah's story, for saying to people like me who have felt like we don't matter, that you're for some people, but you're not for us, that our pain is unseen and unheard and doesn't matter, that we're not included in the great purposes you have for other people, that we actually do matter to you, that you do love us, that you have a great purpose for each of us, that you are loving and trustworthy, and that we can trust you. Oh Lord, we pray this to the praise of your grace. Amen. Sarah's story is intricately interwoven with the story of Hagar, a woman held in the highest esteem by millions in the world today. Why, you ask? Well, listen in to the next podcast in the time of the matriarchs, the story of Hagar.